Hi everybody, this is Chris Morosky and this is a short video on menopause. The goals and objectives of this video are to relate the decline in ovarian follicles to the hormone changes and symptoms of menopause, describe the pathophysiology of the various symptoms of the perimenopause and menopause, and discuss the risks and benefits of the various treatment options for the symptoms of menopause. Menopause, uh, by definition, is the permanent cessation of menstruation resulting from the loss of ovarian follicle activity. Um, and clinically, um, we diagnose the menopause after one year without a period. The average age of menopause in America is 51 years old with a normal range of 45 uh, to 55 years old in age. The perimenopause is defined as the period immediately prior to menopause when symptoms first begin and the first year after the menopause. The average age of the perimenopause is 47.5 years old, um, and the perimenopause is very different for women um, in that it can be variable in length and degree and amount of symptomatology. Um, there's also some irregular uh, menstrual cycles that happen during the perimenopause with variable amounts of bleeding, all the way from some cycles being light and spotting up to other cycles being um, very heavy. The cause of menopause really is the decline in ovarian follicles. Um, at birth, women are born with approximately 1 million follicles total. Um, and by the age of 15, half of these follicles have undergone atresia and are lost. Um, and looking to the graph to the right, if age 15 is uh, the baseline numbers, you can see that this really goes down uh, percentage-wise over time. By age 25, um, the amount of follicles that a woman has is again reduced by half, even compared to age 15. And by age 36, there are only about 16,000 um, follicles of the 1 million that remain. Um, and by the age of menopause, which again on average is 51 years old, there's only um, a few hundred um, ovarian follicles remaining. Leading up to this, there is um, a very early uh, decrease in fertility. Um, uh, looking at the chart on the left, um, that you can see that there is um, very early on a decreased fecundity. Fecundity is the ability to become pregnant uh, with each cycle. Um, and peak fertility is really seen um, in the mid-20s, around age 22. Um, by age 33, um, the fecundity for a woman is 75% of a 22-year-old. By age 35, this is cut down to 50%. And by age 40, um, the fecundity rate is 30% um, of what it is for a 22-year-old. Similarly, um, the risk of aneuploidy or chromosomal abnormalities um, in the um, oocytes um, greatly increases um, with age. Um, this nadir is at around age uh, 17, and you can see that by age 50, I mean by age 40, 50% uh, of the oocytes have abnormal DNA. Um, and by age 42, this goes all the way up to 90%. Um, there are um, various different hormonal changes uh, that happen um, in the menopause. Um, some of these can be tested, um, and some of these um, really are just uh, known about in lab science. Um, the first of these um, is anti-Mullerian hormone. Um, most everybody's going to remember this as something secreted by the Sertoli cell to tell the Mullerian system to um, fade away in the male embryo. Um, but and, and, and in female embryos, this isn't um, uh, present during development. Um, but at birth, um, anti malarian hormone is present in the ovary. Um, and throughout a woman's life, this uh, hormone is produced by the granulosa cells of developing follicles. Um, and it really can be a marker for uh, the pool of recruitable follicles uh, that are left. Um, and as you can see on the graph on the right, uh, a decline in AMH pretty much precedes all other hormonal changes, um, beginning as early as uh, seven to eight years before the menopause. After um, AMH, um, inhibin B uh, begins to decrease. Inhibin B is also made by the granulosa cells of developing follicles. It also declines prior to menopause. And um, as inhibin um, decreases, this lifts the negative feedback on the pituitary and therefore, at this point, FSH begins to rise. And similarly, LHA, LH also rises, um, but this is less pronounced. Estrogen, both estradiol and estrone, fall as the final follicles are lost. Low to absent levels of estrogen are responsible 
for the symptoms and pathology of menopause. Moving on to the symptoms of the perimenopause and menopause, there are various different things that happen to women during this period of time. Um, systemically, there's weight gain um, and uh, night sweats. Women have palpitations, they have breast enlargement and pain. Or women have hot flashes and their skin um, can have dryness, itching, thinning, and tingling. There's soreness and stiffness in the joints, including back pain. Um, there's urinary incontinence and urgency. Psychologically, there's dizziness, interrupted sleeping patterns, anxiety, poor memory, inability to concentrate, depressive mood, irritability, mood swings, and a decreased interest in sex. There are also shorter and longer menstrual cycles with bleeding in between periods as mentioned earlier. And also there's vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. Looking at some of these symptoms more specifically, um, starting with the very common uh, hot flashes, this happens in approximately 75% 75, 75 of women, um, and their occurrence, as mentioned earlier, really does vary. The classic description of a hot flash is the sudden sensation of heat, which usually starts in the face and upper trunk and rapidly spreads. Hot flashes tend to last for two to four minutes. There is perspiration and occasionally palpitations, often, often followed um, by chills and shivering. Hot flashes will last um, over a year in 80% of women. Approximately 15% of women will have hot flashes last into their 60s. Um, unfortunately, less than 10% will last into their 70s. Risk factors for hot flashes include tobacco smoking, obesity, and lack of physical activity. And the pathophysiology of um, hot flashes is that um, the decrease in um, systemic estrogen causes a dysfunction in the thermoregulatory nucleus of the brain. Um, this nucleus maintains core body temperature and hemostatic temperature ranges. Also, decreasing estrogen increases norepinephrine levels in the perimenopause and postmenopause. Um, this causes upregulation of hypothalamic serotonin receptors um, involved in temperature regulation. And so thinking of this like a thermostat in the house, it's sort of like the decreasing estrogen turns down the thermostat so that the heater uh, to your house has to kick in more often um, and str more strongly. Um, importantly, it's not the absolute level of estrogen uh, that causes hot flashes, uh, but rather the relative level of estrogen. So for example, um, it's not that lower levels of estrogen cause hot flashes um, more strongly, it's the um, change and how quickly the estrogen changes. And for example, the acute loss of estrogen with bilateral removal of the ovaries at time of surgery in young women um, causes much worse and much more prominent symptoms. Um, next, vaginal, atro vaginal atrophy is very common in the menopause. Estrogen deficiency in the vagina leads to dryness due to a reduction in vaginal secretions. There is a loss of rugae. There is increased inflammation and thinning of uh, the epithelial lining of the vagina and lower urinary tract. There's also loss of normal architecture. In this um, sort of grainy picture here, you can see all of the symptoms of uh, dryness, um, loss of rugae in the vagina. Um, there's redness and inflammation. Um, there's also thinning of the vaginal epithelial lining and loss of normal architecture. Osteoporosis is a very important uh, topic to discuss with perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. Um, as you can see in the diagram on the left, uh, peak bone mass is uh, pretty much achieved by both uh, males and females at about 35 years of age and then starts to steadily decline. And what you notice for the female is that around the age of menopause, there is a steep loss um, of bone, bone loss due to menopause. Um, without going into too much detail, uh, decreased estrogen causes an increase in osteoclast numbers and an increase in osteoclast activity within the bone. Um, and these cells are all responsible for um, an increased bone resorption. The consequences of osteoporosis is a loss of bone mass, increasing the risk of fracture. Um, women will lose height due to this and have vertebral compression. Um, one in four women greater than 50 years of old will will develop osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is a weakness of the bones. Um, there are 1.3 million bone fractures per year due to osteoporosis in America, and there are approximately 30,000 osteoporosis-related deaths per year in the U.S. Women also will have um, significant mood disturbances around the time of the perimenopause and menopause. Uh, most commonly, women experience irritability, nervousness, anxiety, and depression, and frequent mood swings. 
Um, it is um, unsure if uh, this is a direct effect of the decreasing hormones um, or if this is just related to the hot flashes, night sweats, sleep disturbances, and physical changes that are associated with the menopause itself. In terms of management of menopause, there's several um, management options that women have. The first is expectant management. Menopause is a natural process, and over time, most women do find the symptoms of menopause do tend to resolve. Um, more commonly, um, at least in the doctor's office, we're discussing systemic hormone replacement therapy, which gets called HRT. There's local hormone replacement. There are alternatives to hormones such as gabapentin, clonidine, SSRIs, and antidepressants. And also there's herbal treatments, which women will commonly seek out. Not to go into too much detail, and I don't want anybody to remember um, the specific numbers here, um, but you can't have a talk about menopause without discussing the Women's Health Initiative, as this really did change how we approach um, menopausal treatment um, in America and around the world. Um, this study looked at um, over 161,000 women who were generally healthy and aged 50 to 79. Um, and the study basically was discontinued in the combined HRT group um, because of an increased risk of breast cancer, coronary heart disease, stroke, and venous thromboembolism. Um, this was a surprise to the researchers because they thought that by providing estrogen to women at this time, they would be um, reversing the effects of coronary artery disease, and this was uh, not seen. Um, in the um, estrogen-only arm, um, this group was discontinued early uh, due to an increase in stroke and an increase in DVT. In this group, there was no difference in coronary artery disease, um, but there was, um, and, and there was um, decreased um, breast cancer and decreased bone fracture. What was seen in the estrogen and progesterone group was that there was an increased risk of thromboembolism, an increased risk of stroke. There were six more heart attacks per 10,000 woman years, and this was worse in the first year. And there were eight additional cases of breast cancer per 10,000 woman years. They did see um, bone loss prevention and colorectal cancer prevention, um, but because of the increased risk of DVT thromboembolism, stroke, heart attacks, and breast cancer, um, this study was um, ended early. So where are we with recommendations based on that data? Um, basically, what we do is review the risks and benefits with the patient. As you can see, it was per 10,000 woman years, so the actual incidence of these occurrences was pretty low, but um, relatively speaking, it is elevated, so we do discuss that with patients. We do try to use HRT for the shortest amount of time that is possible, and we always use the most minimal effective dose. The contraindications to HRT um, absolutely are pregnancy, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, and recent vascular thrombosis. And the relative contraindications include a history of DVT, pulmonary embolism, or stroke, established coronary artery disease, breast cancer, especially if it's been um, less than five years out, um, high-grade or stage endometrial cancer, and liver disease. Um, and all of these things are relative contraindications because the dose of the estrogen for HRT is uh, much less than um, what we see in, say, combined um, oral contraceptive pills. For systemic hormone replacement therapy, there's lots of different types. Um, lots of women will take oral pills uh, similar uh, to birth control pills that they may have taken when they were younger. There's also transdermal options with patches, and they come as estrogen only for women who've had total hysterectomy or combination patches of estrogen and progesterone. And there's also topical options such as lotions, gels, and sprays. Local estrogen can be applied to the vagina. Uh, Low-dose estrogen um, can decrease systemic absorption um, and really eliminates the need for progesterone even in women who do have a uterus. Um, they do not really affect the vasomotor symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats, um, but they can be very helpful for atrophic vaginitis. Um, women can either use a cream, um, a small pill that's placed in the vagina, or a ring, and uh, the ring contains um, enough hormone for 90 days. Um, this picture displays um, vaginal dryness and atrophy on the left side with thinning and redness and inflammation on the left, and then on the right, um, this is just um, six weeks after treatment with topical estrogen, and you can see that there is less thinning um, and certainly much less um, inflammation. 
There are alternatives uh, to hormones that women can take for some of their um, perimenopausal symptoms, but this really is focused on the hot flashes only. Um, women can try gabapentin, um, clonidine, which is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, um, and can be taken as a pill or transdermally. Also, the selective serotonin and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors of uh, venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, uh, can be used. Um, but it is important that if women are on tamoxifen, SSRIs can decrease this effect. Um, and there are other different sleeping aids that women can uh, take to help them sleep at night with their hot flashes. Women will sometimes investigate herbal medications. Approximately 50 to 75% of postmenopausal women will use alternate therapies um, at some point. Um, this is even higher um, in women who have breast cancer who are looking to avoid estrogen and progesterone. Um, however, it's important that women um, know that black cohosh and phytoestrogens have estrogenic activity and may have increased risk in the setting of breast cancer. The herbs that um, medica the herbs that women will be um, looking for to use in, in this setting are black cohosh, vitamin E, and the phytoestrogens, which are flaxseed, isoflavones, and red clover. Finally, um, and really most importantly in frontline uh, it's important to keep in mind that behavioral modifications will also help with the symptoms of menopause. So paced respiration relaxation techniques, exercise, diet, weight loss, and support groups all are very effective in treating menopause and carry much less of the risk compared to uh, hormonal therapy. So that's about it for this video. I think that we able we were able to um, relate the decline in ovarian follicles to the hormone changes and symptoms of menopause describe the pathophysiology of the various symptoms of the perimenopause and menopause, and discuss the risks and benefits of the various treatment options for the symptoms of menopause. Thanks so much for watching. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you in class. Take care.